More soda, please. I think it's actually worse being in the room with each other. It makes it <laughs> what do you mean by worse? Well, it's just being in. Yeah. In OT's it's physical presence, it's just it's disconcerting. It's so arousing. <laughs> <laughs> Hello everyone and welcome to the Hobby Breakfast Show. Kick off your mornings with war gaming and hobby chat. Very special episode for everyone today because, unlike normal, we are not recording this from our own separate homes, but we are in the same room. In your home. In my home. They've invaded. Please call the police. I do not want them here. But my co-hosts for this morning are sitting to my left, OT. Say hello, OT. And to my right, we have there. Hello, everyone. And I am, as always, on odds. Good. Elvish for end, apparently. And that bit will be cut. <laughs> right. I think we will have a little chat then about news this week. Um, all that news. All that news. Nothing Middle Earth related, but there are a couple of other things that I think we we want to point out um games workshop releasing free rules un unheard of three pages of free rules three pages of free rules for kill team a vast amount more for warcry yeah but they have actually released something for free so there you go Other? you mean the three usual the three pages, yeah. yeah. I don't think it's enough to play the game, though. Do you not? Okay, so you are the only person in the room who has actually played the current edition of Kill Team. In your opinion, then, you couldn't play it from those? Um, you might be able to play a really simple list, um, or it'll give you an idea of what to expect, but you're not going to be able to... There are going to be things that come up where you're like, oh, I, I need to solve this uh, problem that's come up, and look at the three page of, pages of rules and think, well, this doesn't say anything about it, so... I mean, maybe you could play a game. It probably wouldn't be very good. So you feel like it's a bit flawed, as in it gives you like the raw mechanics, but it's going to just create more questions and answers for new players because yeah. they're just going to end up inevitably doing stuff which they then don't know what to do. I feel like Games Workshop think it's a gateway into introducing people, but actually it's just going to cause frustration. Yeah. And why not just release all the rules? As yeah, in, as in not three pages. I feel like they did a they did a much better job with Warcry. So um, I think I'm the only person in the room who's played Warcry. Mm -hmm. So Warcry as a game is probably a little bit less. It's a little bit less complicated than Kill Team, I think, especially in how it's written, and um, it, it has a couple of mechanics which are kind of you know what makes it somewhat unique. Uh, they pretty much just put a PDF out. I think it's almost thirty pages. Which is a really interesting difference that they went kill team. Yeah. We will will cut it down into three pages of like size nine font, and we will just like <laughs> and like some pretty crappy photos. I I don't know. Like they've taken out um, photos of models and they just put in like something that looks like it was made on paint. Yeah, with some circles. It probably was made on paint. It might be clearer. But and it's, then it's, it's not it's not like yeah like quality pages. But then for Warcry, I I haven't seen the current edition of Warcry rules. I played first edition, but to me it looks like they've just released the PDF of the rulebook, which is really strange that they've done that for two games they own. I mean, I'm I'm I don't play Warcry, but I've looked and there seem to be like four basic factions. And for one of those, it's like chaos rules or something. They've released four 13 page documents. So that's like 50 pages. Yes. And this is the other interesting thing. So, Warcry had a book. It's called the Warcry Compendium, yeah. which has all of the rules for models which aren't like current edition models. Yeah. Which they release for free. You can buy it as a oh, book, what? but every single page of it's available online, which is what OT is talking about. What did Kill Team get? Just the book. Well, they, they got the three pages, but they also got... Oh, you mean this week? Yeah. Oh, I'm so excited. Um, it's a 2022 uh, book of rules for all of the stuff that they've released this past, past year from White Dwarves and even some of the old stuff, um, the Starlissian Star Striders, something like that, um, the Rogue Trader box set, called. and your Poxwalker dudes. The Gellar Pox Infected. Yeah, Um they get rules now. I was going to sell my team, and now they have rules, and I don't have to sell them. And I can actually paint them. 
But again, kill Maybe. team. Kill team. <laughs> that's a lie. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Some, sometimes. But kill, kill team, you have to buy those. And then for Warcry, they were like, no, have the old rules for free. Maybe they just. Maybe Kill Team is just a bit more popular and they think they can get some money from it, whereas they need mm. more incentives for, for people to play Warcry. Maybe. I can't see why else they do it. No. It's just a, a weird one, isn't it? Just how the same company running what are essentially, in many ways, the same game, because they're both the skirmish versions of their two main games. They're very similar in how they are making them. They're both going for this kind of once a quarter box set, but they've gone for a completely different approach to releasing the rules. I suppose in that respect, it's a bit like Star Wars in that Star Wars just makes everything better, as we know. Mm, yes. The IP can just carry, carry it. Any, any minute. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and as we know, Star Wars directing. and 40K are both fantastic high-quality products. Yeah. So moving on from uh, Games Workshop, um, something else that we wanted to talk about because the Lion Rampant second edition rules have been released. Um, I've had enough time to flick through these now. And I want to read it. Yes. It looks good. I'm, I'm excited to give it a go. There's a few things that I've picked out which I think are quite interesting in terms of just like um, how games were. I just wanted to quickly uh, highlight. They're probably not new things, but... Um, one of them is this uh, rules mechanic called uh, Making Boasts. Making Boasts. Um, so as part of Lion Rampant, um, essentially you make a boast at the beginning of the game and you can score bonus victory points based on what you say. So for example, there is a boast called I shall slay their leader. Uh, your leader must kill the enemy leader in a challenger attack. Routing the enemy leader does not count as success. If the enemy leader refuses your challenge and survives the game, you succeed, but only score one glory. So you basically get one victory points if they refuse to fight you, and three if you kill them. But then you get minus one if you didn't manage to achieve it. But they're set uh, boasts, or can you just be like, I'm going to wipe you from the table, and your opponent's like, I think that's worth a lot of points because that's a big boast. To them. There are set boasts. Yeah. Um, there are a lot. So actually there are ones um, like what you just said, and they're at different levels. So you can do a difficult one, like uh, for example, uh, my warband will stand firm. None of your units may route or retreat off the tabletop. So none of your units can run away. But there's also an easy one, like for example, uh, I shall strike the first blow, one of your units must declare the game's first attack. So it's, mm. it's a bit That's like oaths, oaths in the SVG tournament where you've got like mini objectives to go. It is. It is main. a bit. Yeah. It is a bit like that. A bit like um, so when we were talking last week about oaths at Ardicon, how you have like an extra thing you're working towards. But there's so there's loads to choose from, and I, I just thought that was quite an interesting way of making each game a little bit different. And you can kind of, I don't think it's not intended to be competitive, but you can kind of tailor your list around potentially. Mm. Like, you'd only take high-quality, courageous troops that aren't going to flee. Exactly, yeah. I suppose you could game it a little bit, but I don't think it's, from what you've been saying, the sort of game where you do no. that. And then the other thing I wanted to uh, pick up that I thought was quite interesting was a terrain generator. Right. Um, so a 3D printer? <laughs> that would be good. Is this before the game? Yeah, every every or... book comes with a free three D printer, <laughs> exclusive <laughs> with pre orders. That's an excellent from... deal because that was only like thirty pounds. It was only fourteen pounds. Yes, very wow. very good value to get that three D printer. This book was fourteen pounds. It was fourteen pounds from uh, Blackwell's, uh, and they sent it in advance. And they sent it accidentally in advance. So <laughs> but the three D print hasn't arrived. Yet, so. <laughs> the three D printer will <laughs> arrive later, I'm sure. Um, terrain generator. You know how in like um, most games you like roll to see what scenario you get. Yeah, it's like that, but for what terrain? So, for example, it's got Western Europe uh, terrain generator. Roll a d6, and then you place what it is. So on a one, you're going to put down four hills and two woods. But on a uh, <laughs> six, you're going to place one river, one stream, one village, and three woods. You only roll. Uh, sorry, a whole village. You've got to deploy a village. It says three buildings. Like, okay. So. So um, you roll once, and then that's your board. And then that's it. It doesn't tell you where to put the stuff, but it's a way of kind of saying 
you are going to be playing and this is the style of terrain. Right. But then there's also Eastern Europe, North Africa, Middle East. So it's intending to make it kind of like historically where an army would have fought. Yeah. Do they make their own terrain? No, this is just a book. So there's no models or anything associated with Lion right. Rampant. But I guess it means that it gives you a guideline as to you could use this sort of scenery that will work with the rules yeah. and... Uh, if you want help building a setting, then use these things. Yeah, mm. but I just think it's an in, an interesting idea because mm. I know some games do do it where you must place terrain in a certain location. Yeah. But then this is kind of like, we're not going to force you to place in a certain location, but we are going to give you an idea as to what kind of map you're playing on. Yeah. So it's just a, an interesting little uh, thing. Do you then um, like place things alternate? Uh, like you alternate placing stuff or is it like you just um, both kind of make a pretty looking board and go from there all it says is agree with your opponent how you'll define each piece of terrain before you begin each game also agree how the effects of combined terrain types will be handled uh, when it comes to laying the selected terrain out on your tabletop any special scenery notes in the scenarios in addition to other terrain chosen should be placed first afterwards all other terrain should be placed one piece at a time by alternating players oh, okay there you go so there is a bit of two and yeah. Fourth. Um, I imagine you deploy after placing terrain. Don't you? Yes. Okay. So you can't be too biased. So, so just a, an interesting little kind of way of coming what your board's going to look like. And um, I mean, it's it's not going to be good for people who don't have a lot of scenery. But if you've no. got a lot of scenery and you're kind of like, what type of board should we choose? You can do it randomly. Mm -hmm. So it's just a, an interesting uh, little thing. It's quite a lot of scenarios, which is good. And then the last thing I want to pick out is this simple campaigns so a way of linking five battles together and then depending on how you do you might um end up with slightly mismatched war bands so basically it asks you to make five lists and then you put your lists in a random order hidden from the other player those lists are wow. at different points wow okay so that the, the the maximum difference is a 10 point difference. A 30 point less versus a 20 point less could happen. That sounds pretty big. But it's unlikely. So, the way it works is um, you pick one warband of the 30 point, you pick three warbands that are 24 points, and one warband okay. that's 20. Mm. And then you're going to play five scenarios in a row as a campaign, and you don't know when your opponent is going to play their warband. Wow. So, it's going to be quite even for the most part then, mm -hmm. and then most even two to four games that are yeah. either a mismatch, yeah. or your twenty is playing their twenty, or yeah. your thirty is playing their thirty. I haven't read too much into whether or not you can kind of choose which warband is going for which scenario, or if it's completely random. Do the outcomes of the games affect each other, or because that's always been a feature? I can only speak for SBG, but like yeah. the SBG campaigns you get in the books, like do have knock-on effects on. I yeah, quite like that. Bit. I think that's yeah, cool. But I mean, I guess with this game, you could just kind of make it up. If it does. It does seem less competitive. More I, I don't. I don't it? think that what's suggesting the rule book does. But I think you could very easily do it as yeah. you just say that the loser then plays with the small ball band if you wanted to do it more along mm. on that line. So or they just there. have a minor disadvantage. Yeah. Like, and there's a lot of scenarios. There's I think sixteen scenarios. So there's quite a lot of scope even within just these rules to um mm. kind of go about doing so what long. era did we settle on trying to do some miniatures i think we were thinking of maybe getting into this game or we've had a few discussions haven't we we were thinking maybe hundred years war maybe all the roses or maybe crusades and i think it'll, it'll just end up being what we mm. feel like yeah. so we'll see and also yeah. the, the miniatures we can get like it's not even necessarily about the historical period like if if we see a set of miniatures we particularly like right yeah i think that's as much motivation as anything yeah so. um the rules are so flexible that you could just run to a historical armies i mean personally i prefer like a historical theme so especially like if i was going to collect no two armies yeah <laughs> but if i was going to collect two armies i'd want them to be from the same historical setting yeah. But if you're just wanting to play the game, you can just do whatever you want because the rules are just elite unit, normal unit, rubbish unit. There's no like kind of this is the Roman unit. Bug so, aliens. Yeah. Bug aliens are probably not going to be a, a, a massive feature of Lime Rampant, I'd suggest. <laughs> there is a fancy version. 
called Dragon Rampant. Is it not just kind of the same rules, but it has magic rules and monsters? Oh right. So, and and so I mean, if <laughs> if you end up liking the concept, we could quite easily play it with just oh. four drinks models. Oh you're right. Anyway, yeah. Interesting. When SPG dies in a few years' time. When SPG dies in a few no, years' time. R.I.P. R.I.P. Anyway, fucking Amazon. Mo- moving on from that depressing. No, thank you, OT. A hobby. <laughs> OT, you can kick us off because you are basically the only person who has done what might be called hobby. What do you mean, what might be called? It is, it is hobby. Well, no, no, no. I was going to say that me and Mayor have... Right, my painting's pretty bad. But... <laughs> 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 I'm calling you out. It's efficient, okay? Jeez. Oh, I was going to say me and Mayor have played a game, but yeah. I don't know if that is what we're really referring to as hobby. No. I bought some paints for, yeah. for a friend. There you go. I helped them decide what they were going to paint for them. What what did, paint did you buy, then? Oh, well, now I'm stealing uh, OT's limelight, so I want to hear about that. that. Uh, OT's over. lost his chance. He no, complains. I passed it by. I'm true. He complains. I will be cutting that bit from the podcast. Personally attacked. Man, what paints did you buy? What? what oh, now I have with? to remember. Um, my Your friend, friend is put, yourself. It, <laughs> my friend is uh, building a Tyranid kill team. He's got some gene stealers and some warriors. Um, he's never done painting before, so uh, I didn't want him to wander into the games workshop, um, the innocent lamb he is, and get uh, get sailed into yeah. buying twenty se- several things. base layers and all the stuff he doesn't need. Yeah. We ended up only needing to buy one spray paint um, and uh, two contrast paints, a yellow paint. <laughs> uh, for listeners... Uh, oh, oh, o- Onin is a crippled old man. Onin, Onin's <laughs> just, he decided he, the sofa's too hard for him and now he's sitting on the arm of the sofa. It's more just that my, my legs and back have gone from today. The fact anyway, he's continue. named after an end is very appropriate. It is. I have to, <laughs> I have to keep completely You would literally snap times. if you put any pressure on yeah. him at all. Yeah, it's true. I think I just <laughs> <laughs> pinched an earth or something. <laughs> anyway, continue. Go on. There's two contrast paints. So the flesh of them is going to be like a dark grey. The carapace is going to be a black, so contrast for both of those. And then uh, there's like a yellowy contrast. Uh, it's like the Poxwalker one. It's like a greeny yellow. That'll go over all the bone stuff. And then a, a, a flat yellow layer. Uh, flash gets yellow, so it's quite bright because he wanted them to have a kind of. I have that yellow. Yeah, a bit yeah. of a waspy appeal. So okay. he's going to dry brush that over the carapace. I remember seeing an army painted like that. Yeah. They, were they black and yellow? Yes. Yeah. They were in the shop window in Games Workshop when we were teenagers, I think. Yeah. So yeah. He, he really liked those. Uh, so he's going to dry brush the carapace uh, and paint the eyes yellow. And then we've got like a gloss overcoat that he's going to put on the carapace to make it glossy. And that's all he needs. And then he can base it. I feel like Tony is probably quite a good choice for first. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, they're really good in melee apparently as well. So we're going to have an interesting game next week. But that was essentially my only hobby this week. Very nice. I I literally haven't painted anything, so we'll, we'll skip on. Oh, is he gone then? Because you actually have done quite a lot of hobby. I have. I have. Yeah, tell us. Yeah, I mean, it's it's my continuation of my policy of quantity over quality. Like, it's all about getting models on the board. Uh, OT is underselling itself a little bit. <laughs> Continue, yeah. Even if they're not identifiable as the original models they were intended to be. Um, so I'm still going with my Angmar list. Um, I'm, owing to my early blitz of heroes and, you know, interesting models, I've banned myself <laughs> from painting interesting models until, I, <laughs> until I painted the 30th. It's a, the classic era of painting yeah. the stuff you want to yeah. paint before yeah. the chaff you don't chaff. want to paint. Um, yeah. So I've got 36 orcs to paint. Um, I've currently done 14 guys with spears, and then I also did a banner and some dead marsh spectres this week. So, Which is a lot. Of, which is a lot. Given and, that I'm, I'm fairly sure due to... Kind of when we were free, we recorded the yeah. you know, last episode four days ago, so yeah. it wasn't even a full week. Yeah, yeah, so it's a lot. It's yeah. impressive. And some of them aren't shit. What's well, good? <laughs> Congratulations! <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Well, yes, I mean, both well puddings in the eating. That's just my opinion. There you go. God, I'm not sure I've ever painted that many models in such a short amount of time. Yeah. You painted one beaver thing for your furry yeah I, I was <laughs> i was saying earlier that i think that it would i would spend that long painting a single model for uh bows and badges yeah so oh that's what it's called sorry that's what it's called yeah not not beavers and furry things yeah 
easily confused. Good. And then, of course, the other hobby thing we've done, which I think we'll, we'll quickly mention, we won't go into a great amount of details because we're going to be writing up some battle reports for it, but we've played a few games with the armies that we built up over the last few months because mm. we were building up 700-point armies. We did it in a kind of... Uh, the classic games workshop tale of four gamers we did that kind of thing we built up some forces 700 point middle of strategy battle game army um Crabane are really good i think was the takeaway yeah yeah and yeah. ot rolls like shit yeah it's yeah. it's real I, I think dice rolling is my main takeaway um very good at winning priority though. very good uh, strangely good <laughs> it's, um, it's amazing it's just a shame about which yeah just consistent yeah and yeah, Witch King's really good, Numenorians are really good, but it turns out if you don't win any combats and wound any characters, you're really going to struggle at yeah. all points in the game. Mm -hmm. And also, if uh, you can just roll straight sixes, then yeah. bombs are really good. Yeah. Bombs are very good yeah. as long as you only roll sixes. Yeah. Um, don't roll a one, yeah. roll a six. That's my advice yeah. for using the Isengard uh, bomb, and it works very well yeah. if that is what you do. Um, tactical advice from... The tactical masters from a top 20 play in the mayor well i think um no spoiler but uh it, if you may have beaten me today then d that makes you a top 20 player i would argue top 10 but top I, 10. I wouldn't <laughs> i wouldn't go so far as top five and actually i'm not that big headed but top yeah. 10 i think is, having stayed in the there. game for quite a while i think i'm top 30. It's true. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. Because there was briefly a point. The game did go over two hours, so I think top three is reasonable. True. So there we go. There, there was a point yeah. where a model died. <laughs> At <laughs> least <laughs> one model was killed in one. that battle. Yeah. Um, and if you would like to read more, I'll put a link to those blog posts for anyone who's interested. Probably very few people, yeah. but anyway. We're going to have our first song then, which I have not prepared. So, so we'll perform it live. <laughs> <laughs> Coming live. live. Because it has just appeared on my Spotify, it's a muse with Uprising. Okay. And we're back. That was Uprising by Muse. So, main topic for today. We're going to be having a chat. We're not going to be looking at Legend of Jesus. We'll be returning to that probably next episode. We thought as... We were all together, we'd do something a, a bit different, changed up a little bit. The idea then is that we're going to, first of all, have a little sort of conversation about what we see as uh, wargaming mechanics that we kind of like and would like to see used in a war game. They might be things that maybe um, we've seen in previous ones and we kind of just say, I like this, I quite like this idea. And we're going to be applying that to an IP of some sort that hasn't had a war game made of it or we didn't like the war game and we didn't feel the war game really captured what uh that sort of ip was about and so we'd like to remake it in a different way so that's the idea um should we start off then by briefly running through what kind of system are we thinking for the particular IP that we've chosen. Should we start off with the I IPs? Uh, Matt, what would you like to see be made into a war game? The IP I've chosen is The Hunger Games. Um, not so much that I'm in love with it. Um, I don't dislike it, but I thought it'd be interesting to do something that was less of a full-on battle and more of a um, encounter-style board game, almost. Yeah, and it's quite a different concept because obviously Hunger Games is really based around like a survival concept and obviously a lot of video games have used that because that's kind of what a um what those games call like Fortnite Battle Royale Battle, really. Battle Royale that's based on like the Hunger Games and that is what the youth are into yeah <laughs> so I you know there must be scope to do something in a board game version so a good idea will delve more into it in a moment. Uh, OT, what is your idea that you would like to see? Mine is a little bit more generic, and I'm feeling a bit disappointed in myself now. Um, but the two I picked were XCOM and Pirates of the Caribbean. Yeah, I think good choices. Do you see, games. before we uh, move on, Pirates of the Caribbean as in, like, a sword fight or a ship-on-ship ship so, 
I um I had a look at oh this is spoiling all the good points we're gonna make later. I had a look at some games that are available. Okay. And like I'd like to see it turn into like a skirmish game where um maybe you have both like um areas like where you have a ship battle, but then maybe some like quite advanced mechanics for like boarding and stuff like that. Because I think that would be mixing that range stuff with melee. And, yeah. yeah, I think that'd be quite cool. So there are quite a lot of cool. ship games, but I guess. Since Games Workshop discontinued Man of War, there aren't really any yeah. fan. I said mm, Mantic does a weird fancy one, doesn't it? So we've got Pirates of the Caribbean then. Interesting idea. Could do lots of different things for it. Um, so I think, lastly, then, my idea before we start delving into game mechanics, things that we'd like to do, um, I think, and I think it's partly just because it's just such a big IP, and so I think I'm more just su more surprised than anything else that you could do something with Pokemon and you could do something where you have the Pokemon fighting each other, either like they do in the video games, or you could do it more based on the kind of the card game, which is really successful. And then you could do something along those lines, which I think could potentially work. So there. you would just have like the battles and not the exploratory yeah, F because finding Pokemon in long that, that's scene. what the card games like, though, right? Because the card games mechanics are based around you try to upgrade your Pokemon by getting them to evolve. You try to damage the opponent in making sure that you win. I don't see why you can translate that into something, but we'll we'll get on to how I envis envisage this uh, thing's never going to exist <laughs> a little bit later on. Um, Up to ten years, and we're still doing this podcast, and we're talking about the. Pokemon board game has been released. And I will be suing. Yeah, <laughs> straight away. This they, is a record. This is a record. You can pay me now or there will be a lawsuit. But anyway. Um, Any Pokemon board game is made. Yeah. <laughs> they must have listened to this. A very small podcast with a tiny amount of listeners, definitely. Who we value greatly. Who we value greatly. All. Yes, definitely. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. Right. Hunger Games. <laughs> Yes. So, um, what kind what of know? what kind of mechanics are you thinking? Okay. Roughly? Charles murder. Charles murder. <laughs> Charles murder. <laughs> it <laughs> sounds <laughs> right. <laughs> I, I really want. want this game to have kind of two levels. The first level is quite a high up level. That's I imagine almost on a tile or like a hex based map that is the Hungry Games Arena. I think they're they're just giant domes. Yes. They? Yeah. I, I'm not massively familiar with the IP, so. Um, You'll have to forgive me if I get something wrong. Um, but essentially, the high level would be this hex board, and um, you could play it with between two to four players, and then the remaining players, i.e. the 12 that get released into the arena. Um, for those of you that don't know, Hunger Games is basically a battle royale between 12 people. Um, and so, say there were four of you, the other eight would be uh, kind of controlled by the board game, as it were. Um, you'd move from hex to hex to try and uh, find resources or um, other people um, to kill or team up with. Um, and I quite like the idea, I, I don't know if it's something you guys have experienced, but in some games where you're forced to work with someone mm -hmm. um, for a kind of, uh, to achieve something in the short term, but in the long term, you're going to have to fight against them. Um, I. I think it comes up quite a lot when uh, you, you play Monopoly because you might have a set of two like mm -hmm. cards or whatever, mm -hmm. and you need the third one. So uh, someone else has the third one, and you're like, okay, well, um, I'll either help you out later, or I'll just give you way over the odds for this, or I'll you know give you free rent for however long or whatever. And if you come across someone in the Hunger Games who has resources you need, or uh, you just would need to team up with someone because you're being chased down or uh, whatever it is. I, I like that kind of social interaction of temporary to, alliance. Yeah, yeah, having to wheel and deal your way to survive. And you could do that with the other players. I also like the idea that if you get into a hex, uh, you might discover that there is a player there, but you don't know who it is yet. Mm -hmm. And um, if you don't recognize them, you just sort of you have to decide what you're going to do it before you find out who it is. So you're like, I'm going to attack this person. And then it turns out it's one of the other players. Then 
they might so you wouldn't to... know like what equipment the person has or like if they're going to be able to kill you or not you'd have to make the decisions before knowing how strong they are maybe there's some kind of associated observation role that um i don't know if it would operate based on cards or dice um but i think it would be good to uh, you know maybe if you have a pair of binoculars on you that you found or sure. there are certain things so perhaps there's a a deck of cards of resources mm -hmm. and if you come into a tile um, and you roll dice to determine what's in that tile if it's another player you roll a d12 to determine what player is in there players 1 to 12 or whatever um, and um, if there's a resource you draw a card it sounds even more like Monopoly now where you're drawing from yeah. the community chest or whatever you've designed um, Monopoly <laughs> yeah what, what is it community chest and there's another one Chance. 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 chance and remind me what the difference between those are so community chest is generally more positive chance is generally more negative it's, okay it's, so maybe maybe yeah. there's something similar i'm just designing okay. up at this point but um yeah you know, maybe you get lucky maybe you don't and you uh find like one of those crates that gets dropped by your sponsor or whatever in the games um, and you get a gun or a flashlight or whatever it's some kind of card that buffs you or debuffs you um or um you know something else happens or there's another encounter um, or you manage to find a place to stay for the night. And it's essentially a game of survival. And if you were to meet someone else on a tile, um, it might kind of zoom in, as it were, and you might have to fight right. them off so this in is a where mini the, tabletop encounter. The or something. second level goes up. Yeah, so the second level would be a kind of arcade style quick interaction. Mm. Whether that's actually represented by a board game of some sort or whether it's like a really quick um type of encounter where you just roll off um or it's your character pitched against an another character um but that would be the second level essentially what i will say is um a big part of hunger games was the different districts and yes. they all are they all like have one thing that they do because so some like, of them are like trains some, their some entire of, lives yeah, some to of, do some this. of them just do lumber some of them just do fish and stuff like that so right. if you had like a tribute from say district three maybe they have like an advantage in like a water time and stuff like that or mm -hmm. if you're talking about like early yeah. identification yeah like maybe you get more information if you're in a woodland area and you're from district seven or whatever which does love yeah. and stuff like that so that could be i guess or that you can do be... expansions where you introduce yeah Ooh. but like I, I think like so, linking yeah. <laughs> linking it to the different districts would be really cool because there's 12 different ones and they could all have like slightly different abilities yeah so there's a game called pandemic which i've actually brought with me where you can play as different um, kind of scientists or engineers or um, you know, different types of people who have different abilities, a lot mm. like what you're saying. Yeah. So perhaps there could be 12 different characters and they all have um, certain uh, skills and um, deficiencies yeah. uh, that make them unique. And you can play as different ones yeah. in different games and uh, maybe some of them are more hostile, like yeah. in Civ, and maybe some are uh, more willing to share resources. So I, I think it's a really interesting. Well, because also there there are two tributes from each district. So like, oh right. So for instance, like that capacity, like some of them, like the district, the tributes in the districts will team up. Some of them don't. So like that initial interaction could be quite interesting. So there are twelve districts. Or so six. twelve twelve districts. So twenty four twenty four people. Thirteen okay. districts, which is like the rebel district. Yeah. And do they, they take part in? The no, no, they they were bombed to shit by district one. Yeah, right. Like, really. So actually, I. The You'd have to actually. have 24 characters, I guess. But I'm guessing when they get deployed, I, 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 they get deployed away from each other, don't they? No, they all start off in the middle, but then most of them run away because obviously if you stay in the middle, you die. Yeah. So because everyone's there. Basically, yeah. basically you, you like deploy in a ring and then there's really good loot here. So only the strong right, ones... The ring, I remember. So only the strong ones are going to stay yeah. because they... Yeah. So often what will happen is like... Say some people run into ground one what, thing and then run away. And what and they also formed alliances yeah. and be like we'll work together. What they usually do is like, they're allowed to like train to try and like win people over who will like support them in the capital who watch on TV. So what they do when they're training is a lot of the stronger ones will say will team up before they're actually in there. Sure. So they can kill off the weak ones. So you might have an element yeah. where you could secretly before your first turn 
create alliances. But there's still only one person's allowed out at the end, right? Well, yeah, hypothetically. I mean, that's not how it goes down in the film. In, no, 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 in the first film. book, two people get out because they basically manipulate the system. And, and then, then, and then the second, everybody pretty well, a bunch of them get out. Spoilers again. Sorry. Yeah, but that, that's, <laughs> that's not how it's meant to be. Yeah, so that's kind of my concept. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a good idea. Yeah. I like that sort of different levels of. I, I mean, it's not been any game I've played where, like, you have one level where you do things on quite a and then zoom in and, and on a max so level, like total war on yeah, 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 that yeah. more micro level. You zoom I mean, I, there have been expansions for proper war games which try and do like a map campaign mm. and then you mm. zoom in and fight like a game of forty k or something. But obviously, they are incredibly slow. Yeah. Like yeah. they're the sort of things which take you months and months to play. Whilst you're talking about more kind of like something you can play in like an it's a board game, game really, because yeah. it's really a board game. But it gives you that kind of element of you know, strategy and deception and yeah, cooperation. Yeah, yeah. This is also not just about combat. Is it? It's about like yeah. I mean, if you had like a charisma stat, you could like instead of trying to fight the person, try and win them over. Yes, exactly that. So, yeah, that would be, that's a bit of a different take on it. Yeah, I think there's a lot of ways you could make it work. Mm. Um, but also, because there are so many things you could build into it, yeah. it might get too complicated. So keeping it simple would be the challenge, I think. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So what song we're listening to? Well, I thought in um, honour of the Hunger Games, the Hunger Games <laughs> Of course. In honor of the Queen. We're going to listen to Metallica. It's the uh, British National Anthem. Uh, I got the name. Which we it's, have uh, and put our hands across our chest. Born to be Wild by Stephen Wolf. And I was born to be wild by Stephen Wolf. Beautifully re-sung there by <laughs> the mayor. Thank you very much. Because we just listened to and it. OT. Because we just listened to it together. It was good. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> you just listened to a 30-second preview. To that song. Pre-touch of Spotify. As we, <laughs> as we've established, fuck Spotify. Right, OT. Yeah. Are you, are you going to start with Pirates of the Caribbean? Um, yeah, because I think it's the better of the two ideas. Okay. So if we're going to talk about one, we'll talk about that. Pirates of the Caribbean, then. Yeah. Um, I think it would end up... Um, I, I think it would end up being a fairly generic um, sort of tabletop sort of skirmishing game. I okay. Think, I think what I envisage is because in Pirates of the Caribbean you have sort of various different factions. I mean, it depends on the on the film. Like in the first one, you have like Jack Sparrow versus Barbosa, and then later on, it's about the East India Trading Company versus the pirates. So I, I think you could have different factions. Um, I think the temptation would be in general to do like pirates against the East India Trading Company sure. if you want to simplify it like that. But like, there's no reason pirates can fight pirates because yeah. that happens all the time. Um, so what I'd suggest is like you maybe start off with a f you could ha maybe have like a s special boat like the Black Pearl and okay. something like that. Um, but maybe you start off with like a generic boat and then you can fit it with upgrades and like maybe each of the unique characters brings like a power to the ship. So like they get better okay. at boarding, yeah. um, like maybe Jack, I think Jack Sparrow is like, he's pretty unpredictable. So like you could yeah. like have some, something that links to that. Sure. So X-Wing have something very similar where you pick like an X-Wing and then you put it, you put a pilot in yeah. as a character yeah. and they buff the X-Wing in some oh. way. Um, so yeah, that sounds awesome. Yeah, for sure. And like, so because there are so many unique characters in Pirates of the Caribbean, I think that's the way it would go. Like you would and maybe even just have like generic ships, don't bother with the Black Pearl, but like um you you have a ship, you put some crew on it, and then you you give it a captain as like an upgrade sure. and then it gains abilities. Um I think you the boarding stuff I'm not quite sure about because I don't know if you could choose how many crew go on the boat? I don't so, know if that would really work. Now, I I have actually played a naval game, Black Seas, okay, and in that game, because obviously you just have the ships and they're at one seven hundred scale, you obviously it's quite abstract in terms of boarding. Mm -hmm. What they do is when your ships meet, you just kind of roll dice to see what happens, and you have a number which kind of records how large your crew mm -hmm. is, and yeah. often, obviously, when all the actions happens 
during the time period, yeah, you would probably send over most of your crew because you yeah. just need as many people as possible to kill the other guys. So, do you see it like that, or would you prefer well, more of a kind I'm of like wondering how game? we talked about the mayor's idea? If you like mm. have like a wider board for the sea battle, and then you have a side board which has like two boats that have just crashed together, and do you, you think that, you, that, that would... for boarding. Obviously, that would be really cool. Do you think that would be like too much though? For because oh yeah, way too much. Yeah, but it would be cool. <laughs> but it would be cool. <laughs> um, it would be cool. I, yeah, I, I, I give I, you that. The problem, is, like the reason I picked this, is because I think I don't know if any board game has really done like the boarding mechanic properly, and mm. that's kind of what I wanted to focus on. But then maybe it's for this exact reason that that's really hard to like replicate in a way that is you know positive as a game mechanic. I almost feel like with Pirates of the Caribbean, you. Do something a bit like Star Wars Legion, where like you really focus on the heroes. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Like you, it's definitely you, about the characters. You give them like all of their like different like character cards and stuff. That's yeah. kind of what makes Pirates of the Caribbean. Yeah. Like, yeah. like fascinating. So and I, fun. I'd almost say like the ship combat's not that a big a part of the films. Yeah. It would be a really big part of like if it wasn't the films. Mm. So I'd almost be tempted to just set it on. Just have like a board that is the boat, and then you just play it on the boat. Yeah. Well, so literally, thing. just focus on like. They're literally just like sell a mat, which mm. is two ships next door to each other, and yeah. then just have them jumping around and. Mm. You know, I, don't know, but, like, I think there are some like iconic moments from from the films, like yes, where yeah. they're broadside. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's so cool. cool. But then I wonder if like those two things just aren't compatible. Like if if you you literally just can't have a game. I mean, that allows again, the start. If we look at like the styles as a model, the styles model would just say just make two games, just make yeah. X Wing and yeah. Legion. Yeah, I think there's also Star Wars Armada, which does um, like yeah. does yeah. like big ship combat just, quite well. I think what makes Pirates of the Caribbean so fun to watch as well is how kind of crazy some of the maneuvers yeah. are. Maybe yeah. there's a way that yeah. if you're doing naval combat, you can have like um, a, 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 if you have Jack Sparrow captaining, uh, yeah, Black Bell, he can do. He's got like. You know, several wacky maneuvers. So in X Wing, what you do is you decide what your maneuver is going to be simultaneously with your opponents, and then you both place them face down. And when you're both happy, you reveal what maneuver you're doing. Mm. And then if you crash into each other, you crash into each that's other. Cool. If you know, and in it feels like in Pirates, that's what happens a lot yeah. of the time. They're second guessing what the opponent's going to do, and they're having to pre-do crazy maneuvers yeah. so if you focused on the ship battle i feel like that could be really epic because like i mean like for instance barbosa could have like his undead crew and then like david yeah. jones his ship can like dive under the water and then come up yeah. and he has the crack his ships are like, very unique and yeah. i think i think that like yeah i think that was part of the reason i wanted both in one game but then maybe you do just do them as two separate things but would you have um would you make it so it's a bit like a war game in that you sort of collect a range from a faction or would you make it so it's like the game comes with the three factions and you each play one because otherwise I imagine you've got you know Barboza fighting Barboza fight, fighting Barboza. Oh yeah, like I think I think you would have a gen basically when I was thinking of like the melee aspect, you'd have like a generic crew and then you'd have heroes like in SBG for instance, where you yeah. have like you know a pirate with um I don't know a, a rifle a massive or, a, or, or a, a flintlock or whatever yeah and then you'd have pirates with swords pirates with like boarding hooks and stuff like that who get an advantage from you could always do like a uh, make your own pirate cups as well yeah. that could be quite fun yeah. within the pirates mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. also because there are so many pirates from history that like yeah, yeah. No, no reason and a lot of yeah. them did then get a representation in pirates yeah. Caribbean. so I mean I think yeah, I think that true. would just be quite cool but I think it would have to be really character focused and it's just about how you feel about doing that because I think that's the yeah. strength of Pirates of the Caribbean as a franchise. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. Um, shifting to XCOM. Yeah, I, I think XCOM. I think XCOM yeah. is worth talking about. Is there an XCOM board there game? Is, there, there is. is. There is an XCOM board game. I looked game. it up. I looked it up. Um, okay. So the thing with X, the XCOM board game, from what I can tell, it's more about like the grander strategy. So yeah. it's like you're constantly oh, in, so the, in the control yeah. room okay. fighting. It's that top level of it. Yeah. So what I would do is I would do that, but with the I want more focus on the skirmish game. So even maybe you put like the grand scale aside, you just focus on like the humans. XCOM would work perfectly with the kill team rules. Yeah, yeah, it does feel a lot like. Well, um, so you can get the, yeah. the percentages when you're doing the 
the cheating and yeah. stuff. Yeah. Like, like uh, it's literally made for it already. So I mean that's yeah. that's why I would do. and it has square based movement and stuff like that. It's probably haven't done that. It, yeah. The only reason I can think that you wouldn't do that is just because there's not enough factions. That it's just humans and aliens. Do the yeah. humans fight humans? Is that non IP? Um, do you have like humans that have been like mind controlled? Well, because the commander does get put into the simulation, doesn't he? And mm. that and that's the story of the first game, I believe, where like and then you immediate you automatically lose at a certain point. Have to get back and start, and start, and start again. Yeah, but like, yeah, I don't. I don't think there's ever a stage where humans fight humans from again. Halo, I've played. There's, Sorry, there's no, there's no there. reason you couldn't yeah. have it as a generic humans like humans. But also, like, there's enough unit variety, I think. Yeah. To like, I think, I think I would make it similar to um, like um, beavers and burrows, or whatever. Burrows and badgers. Burrows and badgers. Where, so you're like, going to steal the dice mechanic from burrows and badgers. Well, right? because what I really like about XCOM is that like. Especially when I played it, I formed quite close attachments to the people in my like little right, unit, yeah. my like my really elite sniper so whatever, who can like wipe out an entire stuff. enemy team in like one turn. So I, I think if you highly customize like your four or five characters, I think that would be really cool. Um, and then there's enough campaign system, yeah. permadeath. Yeah. And then like the, and there's enough alien variety. There's enough units and alien like types going on that you could do it. And then. Because even in the game, there's research and you get new upgrades and things like that, like laser weapons, plasma weapons, stuff like that. So, yeah, I think there's definitely capacity. And maybe it would be a more like it would make more sense as a campaign style game where you link each game to yeah. the next one. And if you can like recover a VIP or get some salvage or whatever, like that could really help. It's a bit like the, um, what's the SBG where you, game where you've got like five dudes? What's oh, that? Battle Company. Yeah, it's really like Battle Company. Yeah, company, taking your guys. Yeah. It's you know, literally the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 You know, they've got that for like 40k now as well. Yeah. Not in as much depth, but I think that, that kind of idea awesome. of linking games. Yeah, I'm liking this idea more. More, 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 more we talk about it. I can't yeah. help you, you also accidentally said Halo earlier, and now I want to change to a Halo War game. There is a Halo. There is. My third idea. There's a Halo War game. The company that was making it um, went out of business, but there was a. Halo miniatures game and a Halo fleet game. Was Master oh, Chief really I, I, all the way? I don't know. I, I feel like it might have been 15mm scale as well. 15mm? That's tiny. Yeah. yeah it's, I think that's too small almost. Maybe. I, I might I be misremembered that though. It might have been 28mm. But they, they definitely did exist. I imagine it's not that easy getting hold of the miniatures anymore. But yeah. I'll show you later. Yeah, like sorry, it. sorry for my Halo slip. That well, was just one, just one of my ideas. Like I also wrote down idea. Civ, which I think would absolutely bang the board Civ. game. But there is a game that there exists. Is, there is a board game. Nah, make it more complicated. Make it more complicated. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there are board games. As complicated. I want it to last twenty hours, just like a real thing. You, you li there are literally board games where you will cover the whole board in tiles and cards and tokens and God knows what. Yeah. It could well turn into that. I'm sure some I, people would love it. I always feel those games that I'm just so scared of, like knocking the board. Yeah. Or treading on the board. Or treading on the board. Yeah. Yep. That damn alcohol. Yeah. Right. Next song. I thought we had to have this. It's uh, He's a Pirate by Klaus Bedelt. <laughs> He's a Pirate by Klaus Bedelt. I always think of that meme song when we. Uh, What's the best part I've ever that. seen? It's the best part I've ever seen with the uh, recorder playing it yeah. very badly. Good, right? So, your turn. My turn. So the the Pokemon game idea. How would it work? Now, I kind of envisage this as not really being. Again, probably it's probably going to end up being a bit more board gamey. <laughs> we, we didn't really do so well, did we? We said we were going to design more games. We've got three board and games. And then we all designed a board game. But anyway... Oh, oh, that was good! <laughs> okay, Pirates of the Caribbean is the one and exception. And XCOM! XCOM would be fine. Okay, XCOM yeah. would be fine as well. I've followed the brief. Don't and drag okay. me down with you. <laughs> I'm stealing your Halo idea. Yeah, you know, been done already. Yeah. There, there we go. Right, but... Well, I envisage this as working a bit like Warhammer Underworlds, which I, I don't think any of us have played. It's a bit of a dark setting for Pokemon, isn't it? It is a bit of a dark <laughs> setting for Pokemon. <laughs> so much fisting. <laughs> <laughs> They're being Imperial fisting. 
fucking bonus or no? <laughs> <laughs> so, not Charmander. Oh, God. <laughs> But anyway, Warhammer Underworld has um, like these these uh, rather than playing on a board, you play on something that has hexes, but you can still place them. So you you still get to make it a little bit different. I just think that will work so much better because in Pokemon they play. It's not really a game, is it? It's animal <laughs> abuse. <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's a dog fight. Gla gladi gladi really. Gladiatorial fucking combat between animals, but apparently uh, fine with it, according to the, well, like kids play uh, the TV well. show. And I'm a kid's player. Yeah. But anyway, it's um, underage dog fighting. Do you know Pokemon's dog actually dog. based on, in Japan, like traditionally children would like capture stag beetles and then have them fight against each other? To the death? I think so. The stag beetles kill each other. No, not to the death. Like they, stank, they throw flip. each other off the table. Or it's whatever, it's trying to get the one beetle to flip the other one over. Yeah. But like they they used to like capture beetles and keep them for the purposes of fighting each other. Fuck. Anyway, <laughs> po Pokemon. <laughs> it turns out Pokemon is so what that we're dark. suggesting is. <laughs> but anyway, um, oh god. So it's, it's, it's it would like be Pokemon, but IRL. <laughs> 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 you have to write your own sniping yeah. game. It's a very cheap game, though. At least you got that. You just get a board. Uh, you have to supply your own, your own small animals. Own stack, <laughs> no, but I, I, I see it working a bit like that, where you have it on a grid. You would the obvious thing to do, right? Would be you'd sell the models in like the evolution chain. So yeah. you'd buy Charmander. Charizard, Charmeleon. I said them in the wrong yeah, order. Yeah, I'm looking at you like Come deal on, with it. You're meant to know this. And you buy them in one box, and then there would be a mechanic because in Warhammer Underworlds, there's a mechanic which I don't know how it works, but I know it exists where your models improve in some way. They have like a special version of themselves. You'd have a mechanic where they can evolve, and I think the interesting thing would be is that you would have like a bench of Pokemon, just like in the game. So you could swap your miniatures in and out. And I think you'd eat... I don't think you necessarily actually do do it as in, like, trying to make every single Pokemon faint. I feel like you do it as objectives that you're trying to achieve. And you can switch out Pokemon to try and use the best one for the job. Tricky situation, you switch out. That's something which I feel like you don't get in miniatures games, where you can, like, switch out models and, like, profiles, like, really quickly on the fly. I feel like that's something that you could explore, which I think would be interesting. So in the series, obviously, yeah, they're like throwing Pokemon out, and then you know Pikachu will like yeah. go really far away or up into the sky on something or whatever. Yeah, and obviously Ash can't like recall him because he's too far away. So he can he can? Yeah. So so to balance your game, then presumably every time you withdraw a Pokemon and Ash spawns a new one, or who... who I think it would be like... Has to be nearby, presumably. No, or? I think it'd be like in the video games where the Pokemon can't immediately make an action if you withdraw it. Because so I'm, I'm not... Where do they spawn on your board? Well, I'm not envisaging, like, a board, like, miles and miles long. It would be, like, a small, like, arena like they do in Pokemon where they're fighting on, like, a tiny little pitch. But there are, like, um, rocks and stuff around, or... So, yeah. so why have a why have a board at all, then? Because you can get a bit of movement, there would be some scenery, so you could exploit okay. that. There are things to interrupt. With stuff to do, yeah. I, I, I think... Because of um, yeah, because otherwise you just play the card game, right? Yeah, that's I'm I'm trying to find so like, I a way think, to manipulate yeah, a unique. They they move around. Yeah. There would be stuff to do. There'd be objectives. I don't see it as just that you fight each other to the death. Or to or until they fainting. <laughs> I I would see it more as a kind of you're trying to achieve some sort of other objective. The other option is to have two or three Pokemon per side. Rather than just one v one, they can work make, together and stuff. Then maybe probably makes it more interesting. Yeah, you can have random encounters like you do in the game as you go across the board. Where no, it's you, like, you could make it into a campaign system, I suppose. Well, no, but like not as in like on a grand scale. But on like if you have oh, like NPC NPC yeah, animals. yeah, or, or like it, even if you you like roll the dice and you have like a chance to like I don't know come across a Pokemon in the long grass or whatever that you can then capture and add to your team. Like you could then get stronger as you move across the board until mm. you encounter each other. Like you could have a campaign with, um, system. Yeah. yeah, that'd be quite fun. Well, quite quite like a micro campaign that like, takes like an hour and a half. Because the, the other thing I yeah. can't believe doesn't exist is a um, pen and paper RPG for Pokemon. 
like Dungeons well, and Dragons. Because it exists in a video game format, so... But the video game format's story is shit. Like, you don't play Pokemon for the story, but I feel what like you... you, play it for? you I don't know <laughs> anymore, murder? actually. Yeah, Animal Murder. <laughs> exclusively. <laughs> Just really hate those animals. Okay, okay. But um, missing point of Pokemon. Slightly. <laughs> I don't know. I just feel like that would be an interesting setting. There must like, there must be rules D &D for one of those. Somewhere. There probably they are, but I've never come across no. them. I think in D and D, I mean, you can have a familiar. Yeah, like a pet. Um, yeah, yeah. So, uh, and it's not just a a, a magic thing. Like um, the I think that like the druid, um, he can like spawn loads of animals and stuff. So. Um, I mean, it sounds a bit similar, so I imagine someone probably has reskinned D and D for Pokemon. It wouldn't, have, it wouldn't be that hard. Uh huh. And you could do like an RPG, but that's not really a war game. No, no, but or, I'm, or I'm, even a board game. I'm just surprised that like such a massive IP hasn't branched more. When the card game's so successful, yeah. before they had tried to branch out into this sort of stuff, mm. maybe they have and just didn't work. Yeah. I don't know enough about it. Maybe they haven't felt they needed to. Like maybe Perhaps. Maybe there's there's not so many different things, yeah. ways you could experience Pokemon. Yeah. I, yeah. Don't, I don't think people have enough attention to do a uh, a long haul D and D style campaign of Pokemon when they can literally whip out their phone and have their daily dose of Pokemon Go. Pokemon Go, I yeah. suppose true. But then you could say the same about D and D. Why play D and D when you can just go and watch a TV show set in a fantasy world? It, it, I think it's it's the sandboxiness of it. But you could have Pokemon be sandboxy. You could, um, you could. I suppose part of D and D is that you can just go and slay whoever you want and. Be a bit of a badass. Well, Pokemon, Pokemon, you can go and fight whoever you wanted with your Pokemon. With your Pokemon, <laughs> with your animal slaves. It's a, it's a, well, yeah. I guess it's trading out real life murder for animal cruelty. Which one is your poison? Mm. <laughs> Cannibalism. Yeah, <laughs> that's not good. I'm glad that this has all been demonetized. Not that I was ever going to try and monetize it, but excellent. Yes, yeah. right. I think before we end, I think there was just one thing I wanted to discuss, which was not a new IP, but something which we've all played before, which is Lord of the Rings, Lord of the Rings, War of the Ring. <gasps> uh, system, which I think is shit. Definitely, off. definitely doesn't work. It's the one I was best at. It doesn't work. You play dwarves, that's it's, there you go. It's just it, maths. It doesn't work very well as a game. No. But they clearly could have made it work. Yep. If we were going to re-release War of the Ring, mm -hmm. how would we do it? And what would we want to see? Because I think that that uh, a bigger battle game in Middle Earth definitely could work. It's just... it. They try to do it with a skirmish game and then tweak the rules into a bigger game. And clearly you just needed to redesign the rules rather I mean, than try to do that. Like maybe what you think about first is what were the main barriers to us about War of the Ring? Like what, so, what didn't we enjoy about it? Mo model, model count. count. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was a trip. Like, trying <laughs> trying to get your hands on that many models for a game which they're selling at you as a skirmish game and then yeah. suddenly they say, Oh, by the way, you now need forty eight of those models. Yeah. A bit of a pain. Yeah. Um It was a bit clunky in terms of I, I've never played a game where you're moving blocks of infantry before mm. and I never quite got used to having to manoeuvre it. And I know there's some skill in having the hindsight and the tactical foresight to manoeuvre your forces and yeah. such that you can attack in you know, feel, whatever way you feel best. I feel like that's but, because we're very used to skirmish games because, of course, that came out in a time where like Warhammer Fantasy so existed. But you almost don't have enough things to even manoeuvre. You've got like you yeah. know one massive block of dudes that can just kill everything yeah. and then a few... Uh, kind of skirmishy uh, two base uh, uh, blocks around, cans, yeah. um, but otherwise it didn't feel like I was commanding a grand army. No. Right. So it, it incentivized you to just put all your points into one massive uh, super unit rather yeah. than to actually have, yeah, you know, a, a good variety. That is definitely something which we experienced when we went to a tournament, didn't we? Where yeah, we just got. Absolutely destroyed. destroyed by people who taken like as big units as possible with the most powerful heroes in. Yeah. Didn't didn't the guy have like just four or six blocks of Kazagar, Gimli, yeah. and like 
He just was winning on two. So, so yeah. I, I, yeah, <laughs> made so this one. So basically, there was a combo with Gimli where if you took him with Kazagard and you did Epic Rage and Epic Rampage, um, you had, um, I think it was like you averaged about eleven or twelve attacks, which wounded on twos, and then you re-rolled all your hits. Oh, so, wow. so, so, like, af- so, as in all your hits, you yeah. then got to attack again and attack again and attack again. And yeah. we're dealing on average, I think it was about like 60, 70 wounds. So, everything is dead. Everything is dead. Yeah. So, like, I think the problem with War of the Ring, it felt a bit half assed. Like, it never felt like it, it's, they, they I think fully it's, backed it. It's a bit funny enough because we talked about this with Kill Team, how Kill Team 1 was just like the stat line of Warhammer 40k. Yeah. I whilst the second edition is like actually custom designed for Kill Team. It's yeah. really good now. Yeah. yeah. It was a similar thing with War of the Ring where they just kept the same stat line. They just now said you just got a block of eight guys rather than one. Yeah. But you still you still had like a fight off, didn't you? Yeah. 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 And like weird things like that, which makes sense in a skirmish game where you're having like a duel, mm. but they don't make so much sense in a Which is weird because obviously yeah. they had great success with Warhammer Fantasy. Obviously, they've converted that into a skirmish game, basically. Right? Yeah. But at the same time, you'd think, okay, well, if they made that work, wasn't there a translation they could have done? Because I don't fancy all the guy, all the guys are like really tight on their bases. Like the bases are really small, and you're commanding like proper blocks and stuff. But this was very much let's just make a tray that you can put your skirmish guys. And in. presumably that's because they didn't want to, of course, redesign completely new models that would fit. Do it at a small scale. That would no, be really that, cool. that going to be my I think that, yeah, that's something interesting because with 3D printing, they now have miniatures which are being designed for... Not Games Workshop, though. Not, not Games Workshop. <laughs> so um, one. And presumably not officially, definitely not officially. No. But possibly, they're being, being designed. Possibly, possibly Russia, 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 can say. They're, they're being designed, and you can print them at ten or fifteen mil scale. I think fifteen mil War of the Ring would, would work be a lot better. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. Because you, you, you could, get so much more sense of that scale. Yeah, you get a lot better scale. You redesign the rules. I think big battle games need to be made more abstract. You need to take out the nitty gritty, which worked really well at skirmish. Yeah, and you don't need to say there are twelve guys in this block, so I must roll twelve dice. Mm-hmm. You can just say a large block rolls X amount of dice. Yeah, a medium sized block rolls X, and that way you can't just like spam the mega units because you can exploit the fact that well, elite units roll more dice, and then I'll put a hero in the doubles or whatever. You can just deal with all that problems. So I think if, if we were to fix War of the Ring there, number one, we'd reduce the scale, 15 yeah. mil. Yeah. 15 yeah. Mil. I, I, I wonder if the problem with War of the Ring isn't the mechanics of War of the Ring. I wonder if Lord of the Rings is in itself the issue with War of the Ring. Do you think? But, because, work with a... but like, I'm, I'm just saying that I think the most impactful parts of Lord of the Rings are not the major battles. I think they are the more... Like character based sure. skirmishes, and like, that's, I, that's I, what SPG. Is. I, 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 and that's why I think SPG works so, so well because I think like Amon Hemp to me is much more impactful than say like the Siege of. Minas I Spirit. completely agree with you, and this is where number two comes in. I don't think they should have set a Dream World Ring, and I realise they had to because of licensing. Yeah, but it makes far more sense for when Tolkien writes about in the Silmarillion, the earlier ages. Yeah. He doesn't write it as a story. Lord no. of the Ring works really well as a skirmish game because we're used to a story where big heroes do important things. And they feel so powerful in the game. And which they should do that's because that's, that's how, how they feel be, in how be, they, sure. that's how they feel in the books and films. But if you set it in where Tolkien doesn't write it as a story where he just talks about these massive battles, yeah. that works much better for a big battle system. So but that see, that would be my system. Even you just like, set it early, um, second, first age. Whatever. Like the last alliance where they're fighting on the slopes yeah. of Mount Doom. Like that, that would much work, more work really a, well. Like yeah. you could have the big moment, like Sauron should be really fucking powerful. Obviously like Elendil and Isildur should be really powerful as well. But like you could still have those massive blocks of elves and Numenorean and, and like, yeah. yeah, I think that would be really good. So but even in the, even in the film, like Elrond isn't running around like chopping people no, up. He's, he's giving like, orders. Shoot them. So like that's the Provided difference. you haven't it? moved and you're within six inches. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we won't go there. I, feel, I think I agree with you guys, but also I, I feel like I don't like that 
era as much as I like just the Lord of the Rings films. Oh, I'd much yeah. rather field, you know, an army of dwarves that's not necessarily led by the characters, but it's still an army of dwarves. Like I like that fantasy. Element. Sure. And, and, and maybe they maybe they just do it with the rings of power. Because like maybe. there are gonna be some big battles in there and like the characters could be written really badly anyway. So just sling the characters yeah, the and just, just replicate some big battles. But like, yeah, I, I wonder, because there's going to have to be, I mean, GW going to have to do a big reset with the Amazon stuff coming out anyway, because it sounds like they're going to lose their licenses. So may, maybe you like switch it to, you know, a merchandise based game at 15 mil. <laughs> <laughs> the, these yeah. are generic dwarves. The, <laughs> the only issue is, is if Amazon want to make, like, if Amazon license out miniatures to somebody, yeah. they're going to want to make them at a bigger scale because they want the details. So they look exactly like. Yeah. You think so? The miniatures? Yeah, because th this is why it's Lord of the Rings is. was designed the way it was as well. Because when they licensed out to the film, they said it has to be exactly in proportion to what we've done in the films. So that's why Lord of the Rings is in a weird scale compared to 40k because the cinema requested that. Yeah. But at a bigger scale, it's just not going to work as a war game. I'm not saying much bigger than like 32 mil, 28 mil. I'm just saying they wouldn't want to go 10 or 15 because uh, then you wouldn't get any detail. Oh, I see. Yeah, but okay. then like, are I mean, Amazon, Amazon are a fucking huge company. Like, are they going to care that much about the experience of the game if it does big numbers? Like, I, I just I feel like they're going to sell it to the highest bidder and then. True. You're you're saying they have to do a small scale. Yeah, because like I, I mean, Amazon have taken a huge gamble on the Rings of Power. Like they've thrown so much money at it. They've spent all this I mean, money on the license. Like they need to get their money back. We're, like, we're treating business. we're treating it like how Games Workshop design a game. But we've seen with Star Wars that actually other companies don't go. Let's just make one game. They go. Let's just make loads of different games for loads of different yeah. styles of yeah. gameplay. But they're also like here's a here's a fighter based game and as in like ships and then here's a uh, armada massive ships yeah. basically and then here's a miniature based game there aren't lots of miniature miniature games but i don't i don't see games. i don't see the difference between saying here's the small spaceship game and then here's the one where we zoom out and you have the big spaceship game and saying here's the skirmish game and here's the one where we zoomed out and we're looking at the army game i don't really see a difference there. i would say the individual actual physical models we're using are still relatively small regardless mm -hmm. of the game you're playing. Like you don't have in the Armada game, I don't think, like, you know, two millimeter sized X wings that are in scale. Do you? I'm pretty sure. Oh my god. We'll look it up later. Okay. But I feel like you do get the smaller ships. So there's definitely a Millennium Falcon in that scale. Right. Okay. Well, maybe we're just talking shit then. <laughs> Possibly. Um, I mean we're but... all talking shit, so that's fine. Um, so yeah. I meant I mentioned earlier I watched Zorb Talk's video on this. And yeah. I thought he did some really good like he made some really good points about like the main barrier to all of this is going to be the licenses and like we know it's already been sold to another company, hasn't it? Mm. Like the Lord of the Rings stuff. So that puts GW. Is that four miniatures? I, well, I think that's that's what you said, isn't it? I, I think we'll talk about that another time. Yeah. Just so that we, we don't end up, you know, because that could be an entire yeah. session itself. Sure. But yeah, it, it seems like the company that own the license that license out the games workshop have been bought by another company who is the owner of the company who makes star wars legion and the marvel games mm -hmm. so it would be strange for them to continue licensing out the games workshop mm -hmm. when they could do it in the house yeah. you might argue what was the company because star wars legion got bought a few months ago yeah by this company oh, it was by them okay yeah. We, um, we we can go into all of that and i can go and do some proper research yeah. as to all the company names because i i did I was reading about it, but I wouldn't be able to give you precise information at the moment. Because uh, I think like we're a bit harsh on GW sometimes, but like I think they've done a really good job with Lord of the Rings, to be fair to them. Oh, like, yeah, yeah. SPG is yeah. amazing. Yeah. It's by far it, one it's, of the most powerful it's, it's the best because they don't interfere with it. It's yeah. basically the same game. That's why it's so good. And I, I feel like they have the right people, like right, like we talked about Adam Trek, like writing the rules. Like, they've got the right people there. And yeah. It, always, yeah. it does feel relatively small scale compared to you know, 40k and fantasy, and like that's okay. But sometimes they bring out models like Glorfindel, and you're like, fuck, that's, that's really, <laughs> somebody's worked really hard on that, and yeah. that's really fucking cool. So, yeah, I don't know. I, I think it's just, it would just be a shame if GW stopped making SPG. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have a War of the Ring question. You know the Battle of Five Armies box? Which I do, right? Is yeah. that, um, you, how, how do you find that? Because like, that's quite a small 
so scale Lord of the Rings. It's, it's based on Warmaster, which is considered to be a very good system. It plays very differently to what you guys would have played before. Um, but does it work? Is it good? It, it works. It's good. I've only ever played it when I was very young, when I my dad played it with me because I persuaded him to. So we probably weren't playing the correct rules. So I don't know how it would work now that. I'm a bit more kind of you know up to date with how rules work, but it it was good at the time. Mm -hmm. it, it felt good as like a mast, like you were commanding an army rather than just running around with a few dudes. Because you have like a little commander node with a few dudes. You have you have you? a commander who issues orders to units, mm -hmm. and then the units can move based on those orders. And some of the commanders had like magic, like Gandalf was one of the commanders. Yeah. I mean, I think we played like a very brief game of it at one point, and I thought probably it, it was done. it was quite good. And you had, you know, you didn't have the individual heroism, but you did have a grand scale battle. Yeah, and what your heroes can do in that game is, for the risk of dying, they can throw themselves into a combat. And say a normal unit like rolls three dice, a hero might add a whole dice, so they are actually quite big modifiers. Yeah. So the heroes still make an impact. But it's not like a hero can charge in on their own and do anything. <laughs> they have to join yeah. the unit to do that. But I, I guess it's more the question of like, is there a market for that style of Lord of the Rings game? I think less so. Because and, and like, so, I, I, this, so, this may be yeah. what War of the Rings showed them. Because I think it was yeah. essentially an experiment that they tried, and they were like, actually, this this isn't working. Because yeah, I think, I think there is a super loyal SPG following, and. Like, o obviously, it was a mistake in terms of going, we're going to ignore this massive fan base for a skirmish game we've built up and swap to yeah. a mass battle game. But I think, money, yeah. I think the issue wasn't necessarily that there isn't an audience for it. I think it's more that they tried to do it without establishing a new mm -hmm. set of you know, parameters and miniatures yeah. to create that audience. It was a retrofit, wasn't it? Yeah. And how can we use these models? It was a how How can we use something we already have and just make people buy more of it rather than let's actually design this so it works from the ground up. Like, they, they, could, have, they could have done Battle of Five Armies and continued to do stuff with that rule set. Yeah. They could have just released all of the Lord of the Rings stuff in that scale. Yeah. And if they did it, say, in a, like, metal casting... I feel like at a 10 mil scale, that probably isn't even that expensive to create in comparison to mm. making an injection molded plastic spree. So yeah. there, there were probably ways for them to do it if they wanted to, but they clearly didn't want to. It was about trying to make something work with what they had. Yeah. The one thing that was really good is that Lurtz was really good. Yeah. <laughs> that was the one saving grace. He actually hit like a truck. The yeah. necklace was nuts as well. Mm. He made your unit strike because, like, you had know, cav, good cav, cav, cav I mean, do you remember? Infantry and you made <laughs> you strike one tier. Right? Because interestingly, War of the Ring was the place where Heroic March first turned up. Yeah. Was it? Was it not an SPG? It no, was an SPG. No, it was in War of the Ring. And Aragorn had a special version where he could just yeah. teleport his unit. Heroic, it was like Heroic Journey or some bullshit. Oh, yeah. 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 he, he had to spend, I think it was two might per unit he had. So per, it, per company. It used up basically where all of his, all might, of his might. But, but you could teleport them wherever you wanted. The, yeah. the interpretation <laughs> of Aragorn's ability to take a several day long journey <laughs> to find the King of the Dead and then bring them back, which I think took him like a week or something. Mm -hmm. They interpreted that as you could just teleport, teleport one of your units to anywhere on the board. Yeah. Which was, was a little say, bit good. It was very good. Yeah, it broke the game, but it, you know, it, it was a broken game. game anyway. Yeah, you picked dwarves and sat in the board and then you won. Yeah. yeah. But no, maybe maybe one day we will see a I mean, with three D printing we will see it, it just won't be official. Yeah. But yeah. maybe one day we it will I mean see it should thing. exist. I don't think it I mean it won't replace SBG. No. Like it's it's a very different proposition. I'm, I think, but I think the, that's the mistake yeah, they made. You should separate them. Yeah. It's making me want to play Watcher, to be honest. Yeah. I, I've got well, the watch, we, I've got the Watcher rule book. I look at it fondly. I've still got it. I look at it fondly again. The multi basing, and we can give it a go. I have got no desire to and play rem it again. remind ourselves why we don't play it. Yeah, I think we'll just. Yeah, I, I, the... I, no offense, but I would probably win. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you would. Yeah. Yeah. After today, you're like, let's break it out. There we go. There we go. Yeah. Right then. Um, so next episode, I think we'll return to looking at some legendary legions. So excited. So there we go. We'll be. Back on track. What's next week? Do we get a teaser? 
a teaser. Yeah. Um, Do we not know? I mean, AT, what what two legendary legions are we going to look I mean, at? Next so, week? assume we're going to do the Gondor at War, like you talk about the Black Gate Opens, Grey Company, Return of the King, like there are loads of really good legions in there. Shall we Shall we do Black Gate Opens and Men of the West? Yeah. Yeah, because oh, can we bash on Men of the West, please? I'm okay, so, so it's not that bad. That, it's not that bad. So that will be a discussion for next time, <laughs> yeah, and so we excited. can listen to OT's reasoning for bashing on that. But anyway, if you have been listening to this, thank you very much. If you've got any questions, if you'd like to suggest an IP that you think would be a really good idea, drop us a comment or email. That'd be absolutely great. If you are listening on YouTube, a subscribe and a like would be great. Like all YouTubers, we're gonna ask you to do that we're begging for it but it's fine if you don't but we're not sponsored by honey we're not or raid shadow <laughs> legends <Give us> time. <laughs> or nordvpn i would sell out oh, so we've just named <laughs> if, if we get nordvpn we've named big time anyway um yes if you listen on spotify thank you very much as well there will be information below to contact us there and we will see you next week thank you bye cheers guys Thank <laughs> you.